in the way of that. It'll, it'll take a minute. So welcome to the Davis class. Uh, this is uh, the code name for the class. It's 6530. Uh, some of you have taken my undergraduate class. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, spend a few minutes to explain what this class is about, whether this is the right class for you or not. Uh, then you can make you decision whether you want to stay or you should uh, get behind. You want to like drop a minutes right? behind. It's not too late to drop. Or, right? like so, this is a great level daily class in school computing. And, uh, you know, as, as you can tell, the title of uh, our class is called Database Systems. So, there are two words one is database, the other is system, right? So, obviously, we will be focusing on uh, the subject of database, but with a particular emphasis on systems. With a particular emphasis on systems. So, that being said, that actually highlights the major difference between this class and the undergrad version of a database class. Many of you, even if you have, you have not taken my undergrad database class, might have taken some sort of undergrad database class, right, where you basically learn how to build a database application. In other words, how to use a database system where you simply treat the database system as a black box, right? Then you build various applications on top of it. You learn how to do data modeling, you learn how to uh, use ER to model uh, user specifications, uh, you learn how to build a database application either in a standalone desktop environment or maybe in a web environment, or maybe even in a mobile environment, right? So those are the things you probably have learned, or you have some background uh, or some handles over, right? Even if you have not taken uh, undergrad data, uh, you must have used database uh, one way or another as a computer science student, right? <coughs> so what's this class is about? Well, this class is about building the underlying database system itself, rather than simply treating the database system as a black box and then build application on top. So the objective here is really to understand how database kernel works and how you are supposed to build a database kernel from scratch. So suppose well, I sent you back 30 years ago, right, or 40 years ago for, for, that, for, for that matter. Uh, when we do not have Oracle, when we do not have IBM DB2, when we do not have Microsoft SQL Server, we do not have any database product uh, of, of any kind, how are you going to build a database system from scratch. So that's essentially the focus of this class. And, and by that, uh, I really mean building a database system. At the end of the semester, you will be, uh, you, you know, as a semester long product, you will be working on building a database system. Okay. Uh, and by implementing various modules in this database kernel, right? So in particular, I'm using, in the past, I will talk, about, talk a little bit more uh, regarding this when I come to the core deck part. So let me uh, go over some basic administration stuff first. So my name is Faith Haley. I'm an associate professor in the school of computing focusing on database system and big data systems. Uh, uh, my office hour for this class will be Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, um, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. right after the lecture we have. Right? So every time we have a lecture, then after that I will hold my office hour in my office. But beyond that, uh, you can always reach me by email or simply stop by my office. As long as I'm not busy working on something, I will be happy to assist you. But you know, uh, don't be shy in sending me emails anytime. I, I check my emails fairly regularly, uh, even during weekend. So anytime, just shoot me an email if you have questions. Okay. Now, uh, is, one is Zhao, uh, who is my PT student. Uh, the other is uh, Ti Yuan, who is a master student. So their office hours and their office number are listed in this uh, in this document uh, that you can you can you can look up. Okay. Uh, as well as their emails. The homepage for the class. Is listed here, which is 
this page I'm showing you here, where you can get a copy of the syllabus right here. Okay. And let me come back here. And you can read through this uh, description for the course, but essentially uh, the main objective is to understand different modules in eventually build a little bit kernel. Okay. Uh, and beyond, by, by the kernel, for the most part, we will be working on a relational database kernel. Uh, I will talk about uh, what I mean by relational database, uh, database systems in a minute, in today's lecture. Right? But towards the end of the semester, if, if we still have time left, uh, if we have made enough progress, I will be talking about uh, uh, other data management systems other than relational database systems, uh, such as key-value stores, no SQL, do things like that. Okay? But in my opinion, right, you, if you really want to do well uh, in this space, the foundation is to understand the design and the principles behind a relational data system before you uh, start understanding uh, the benefits or uh, limitations of some other approaches. Right? Now, I mentioned you will be uh, involved in a semester long project to build a mini database system by implementing several core modules in this database kernel. Right? In the past, uh, I've been giving out this product in C++. It's called Minibase. Uh, this year, I decided to make a change right? for two reasons. One is the code base for Minibase was done uh, about 10, 15 years ago. So it's a little bit uh, uh, out of date. Right? So I'm, for that reason, I'm going to switch over to a new mini database kernel called SimpleDB. Uh, that's actually used by MIT uh, and some other top schools. Uh, so we will be building a based on SimpleDB instead of uh, based on Minibase. And Minibase was done in C++, right? That brings up the second point I was trying to make. Many of you, not many of you, uh, but a significant portion of you uh, I have noticed uh, may not have experience in uh, C++. Uh, that's actually been a problem for some students in the past taking this class. Because in order to be good at C++, uh, you have to have sufficient experience in it. Right? You have to know how to manage pointers, you have to know how to debug, citation for dangling pointers, those kind of things, right? You have to basically you have to manage your own memory space. You have to worry about dynamic memory allocations, right? So so that can be difficult for someone who do not have uh, sufficient C++ background. Uh, so you know maybe it's good news, maybe it's bad news. Simple DB is done in Java, okay? So the good news is. Java, in my opinion, is significantly easier to uh, to understand and to cope with uh, because you, bottom line, you don't have to worry about dynamic memory allocation anymore. Uh, Java comes with garbage class. So all the objects you allocate will be automatically, quote unquote, uh, automatically deallocated. Hopefully, right? Hopefully. We all know GVM actually doesn't do a, such a good job. Over time, uh, objects will still uh, be left over, and eventually your system, uh, they will eat over you, uh, the memory space from your system. Right? So, but for the most part, Java does what it, it does. Right? So it's, it's sufficient in the sense that, uh, in most cases, GVM does a reasonable job in deallocate, deallocating instances that are no longer in use. So programmers, you don't have to worry about this uh, dynamic deallocation uh, and allocation of new objects anymore. So SimpleDB is done in Java, uh, which I think m most of you, if not all, should have some experience in Java and should, be, should have no problem uh, uh, to get started on, on SimpleDB, okay? uh, in comparison to Minibase, where many students have trouble uh, to, to, to even just understand the code base. Right? That being said, uh, uh, you may wonder, but 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 I, I do like to highlight that why you know, earlier I said it, this may be a bad news, in the sense that 
you know, if you look at build system out there, you know, many efficient systems that folks have built over the years are actually done in C++. Right? If you look at Oracle, you look at SQL Server, uh, actually work on uh, SQL Server code base, right? Many of these systems are built in C++ for a reason, because when you, when you know what you're doing, you being a programmer, right? When you know what you're doing, the ability to manage your own memory space is a blessing, right? Rather than a curse, right? If you know what you're doing, the ability to dynamically manage your memory space as you wish is a blessing. And you can build really, really efficient, efficient systems that Java-based systems simply cannot match. Okay? However, increasingly many systems, including Smart, Spark, Hadoop, <coughs> are written in Java. It doesn't prevent them from becoming extremely popular in the space of big data management. You know, in the past, I had this impression that anything built in Java is not good. I truly believe in that. Uh, and now I, I took, uh, you know, I take that belief back. You know, I think we, you know, we, we, we should we should treat each programming language uh, objectively, and each has its own strengths and limitations. It really depends on how you use the program language to build the underlying system. The most, the more important part is really the principles. Uh, that guard the design and the implementation of those systems rather than the particular language you use. So for that reason, I think it's, you know, uh, I would love to train you guys in C++. I feel this is not really a, a big fundamental issue anyway. As long as we understand the important principles in, in designing and implementing those systems. So we will try simple DB this year. Uh, that being said, do bear with us, even the TAs, they have not done simple DB before. They have done mini beds before with me. But they haven't done simple DB. And this is the first time for me as well using simple DB. So obviously we will have some glitch along the way. So do keep that in mind and bear with us. Right? Uh, and the product will be used to be mini beds when we uh, when I do uh, when I did mini beds in the past. It's always been one person team, right? So you do everything yourself. Simple DB is a significant upgrade uh, compared to Minibase. Uh, it has almost all the modules you can think of in a database system. Parser, uh, the metadata table, uh, table registration, uh, heap file, index, transaction, query optimization, query evaluation. So there are a lot of modules in it. Uh, I, I feel it's too much to ask single person to work on this. So for the first time in my class, that's, that's the good news part. Uh, I will do a team project. Right? So you will find a teammate and work in a team of two on this project. Uh, at the end of the semester, we will release this in through several assignments, right? Product one, product two, and each product builds on the previous components. Okay? At the end of the semester, what you should deliver is a working database system that's able to take SQL queries as input and transactions and output with us as a typical database will do. Okay? So that's essentially uh, the program. Okay. Right. Uh, objective, you know, I think, you know, the objective of course is to help you guys understand how database kernel works. And by doing that, Hopefully you are comfortable of building different kind of data management systems by the end of this class. Right? Whether it's Oracle, whether it's MySQL, whether it's Spark, whether it's Hadoop. Not only you know how to use them, to me that's, bare, that's really the bare minimum uh, as a computer science student, especially if you want to work in big data management space. I think the more important part is to go beyond those tools, but think about the deeper question of how to build those tools and systems. Right? So that's the objective of this class. Uh, textbook. So uh, let me come back to the homepage to go over the textbook. Uh, we are using this particular textbook, uh, Database Management Systems, uh, third edition. The details 
are available here. This is also known as the cover, right? because the cover uh, has a few cows. I don't know why they use that. Uh, so this is known as a call book. Okay. And you can get a copy of this from Amazon.com, which is fairly expensive. I think over years, over the years, the price of textbook has gone up significantly. I think this will be over hundred dollars if you buy from Amazon. If you buy new. Uh, so what I, what I will tell you is, if you Google a little bit, you will be able to find a PDF copy of this book somewhere online. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to copyright limitation, I'm not able to share those PDF files with you. But if you Google on your phone, don't say you are encouraged by me. Right? So, <laughs> so you should be able to find a copy of this somewhere. <laughs> Alright, uh, so this is a textbook, and additional reading, uh, there is this book by uh, a few professors from Stanford. By the way, the two authors for the first textbook is Raghu uh, and uh, Johannes Gerker. Raghu was a full professor at University of Wisconsin. Uh, they, had, uh, they used to have the strongest database system group in, in the nation, in the US, above the top. Davis groups, but many people have left that, left that group. Right? Raghu has had left, and first he joined uh, Yahoo Research uh, as the director of Yahoo Research, and then he left Yahoo Research and joined Microsoft. Now he's a technical lead and partner at Microsoft, uh, uh, leading their big data team. Okay? Uh, Johannes was Raghu's PhD student and got PhD from with Raghu and went on to uh, become a professor in Cornell University in the computer science department over there. Uh, but not in the same team with Raghu. He's leading another team within the office organization. Uh, he's working on some big graph project uh, in office team at Microsoft. After being a professor in Cornell for, I guess, a little bit over 10 years. Now the second textbook is written by Jeff, Wu, uh, Jeff Wuman and Jennifer Wader. What's the other? Oh, three authors on the second textbook. Uh, they are all faculty members from Stanford University. I will you know, recommend that as a complimentary reading. You absolutely don't have to purchase this book. You absolutely don't have to purchase this book. Again, if you Google a little bit, you actually can find a PDF copy of this as well. Okay. Now the third uh, complementary reading, uh, which is called the Red Book, uh, also known as Readings in Database Systems. I highly encourage all of you to uh, read at least one paper from this collection uh, throughout this semester. So this book, and they actually made a website for this. Uh, so you can read this, uh, read this chapter one by one. And I'll look at the complete book. Okay. So I recommend you go over <coughs> uh, this materials at you know, one chapter per week at least. Okay. Now, can we come back to the syllabus? Uh, academic honesty. So I think you guys are mature enough to know that uh, uh, the bottom line is do not cheat. Uh, when it comes to coding program, uh, we use mouse which is a program developed by uh, this professor from Stanford, who is actually the husband of Jennifer Widow, who is the co-author of the second textbook uh, listed on um, We Just Want to Work. Right? So he wrote this program called MOS. Let me show you what it is. A system for detecting uh, software plagiarism. So uh, we submit code to MOS and it will compare pairwise comparison among all the submissions and figure out how many similarity two submissions are. Then there's the threshold. Typically we use 25% as a threshold. So we are pretty generous, right, if you think about it. Right? Anything below 25% where we think that's okay. Even though 25% is a fairly uh, large number already. Right? Consider the similarity of two submissions, but anything above 25%, uh, I will have to talk to you, and things go ugly from there. You 
want to go down that path. Don't get me started. Right? So the bottom line is, if you cheat and being right? if you cheat and somehow manage not to get caught, good job. <laughs> right? Seriously, right? That's the reality of the world. I don't like that, but that's the reality. Right? On the other hand, the chance of being caught is fairly high in my class. I can tell you that. Of course, I can never say 100%, but it's fairly high. And if you get caught, you get zero for the product. Not for that single module, but for the entire product, you get zero. The product is 50%. 50% of your weight. So you lose 50% of your weight. Twice, right, in product and or, and our homeworks, you got zero for the class. So I'm pretty generous in that sense. I still give you a second chance. If you being caught once in product, you simply lose all points on your product assignment. Not for that single assignment, but for all product assignment. That makes sense. Okay. So don't try that. Now, let's see. So. The grading will be 10% of your grade will go to your assignment. In the past, I've been doing uh, both a midterm test and a final test. And this year, I feel, you know, uh, we probably have a test, okay? And put a lot of emphasis on the project, and then have one final test in the end, and with some written homework assignments. Let's keep it simple that, that way. We will have 10% written assignments, 50% goes to your product, that team product, and 40% goes to your final exam. Okay? So that will be the setup of your grade. And in addition to written assignments and products, I will also distribute out a quiz from time to time. Those quiz will not be graded and will not be part of your overall grade. Rather, they are just for me to provide additional exercise for you so that you can prepare yourself for the final test. You know what type of question you will see from the final test. For all the quiz I will give you, I will provide solution uh, at the end of the quiz. So you can test yourself and check yourself against the solution. But they will not be graded. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, for the product, of course, you are not going to start from scratch. I will code skeleton to you. And of course, taking uh, some part of co uh, the code. Good job is to fill in this missing piece of code, right? Of course, with specifications given. And you will be, like I mentioned earlier, you will be working in a team of two. So it's really, really important. Right? It's really, really, really important to find a good teammate. Right? But don't worry if you end up with an irresponsible teammate. Right? What happened? Well, let me know ahead of time. So I don't want, I don't want to see the situation where two of you uh, at the end of the semester, right? Then that would be a really tough case for me to judge, right? Who has done what, right? If you spot a problem or issue with your program member, let me know ahead of time. Send me an email, right? Then I will talk to both of you and figure out what's going on. In the worst case, uh, we break the team apart, and either if 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 we have two such cases, I can rim, I can do a matching, right? Maybe you and the other guy can match together, form a new team. But then, uh, if you are on your own, then you are responsible to do only uh, half of the assignments by yourself, of course. Right? If that happens, if that applies to that makes sense. Okay. <coughs> Any. Questions so far? Any questions so far? No? No, that's good. We're off to a good start. Now, oh, late, late policy. Uh, there will be, you know, typically it's due one week after it's assigned. Sometimes we we'll give a little bit long, uh, long time, uh, longer time if that particular assignment contains more questions than, than, than typical, right? But but usually it will be due one week after it's assigned, and written assignment is done by yourself. Right? Not, you're not supposed to do written assignment in a team. But I do encourage discussions 
uh, when it comes to written assignment. As long as you do not copy solutions from each other, you can discuss, uh, find out the general leads to a particular question, then work out the details. That's okay. Uh, that's actually encouraged as long as you don't copy solutions from each other. Okay. Uh, late submission is not allowed unless there's a strong and compelling reason for it. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, strong and compelling reason means that it's a family emergency or some nature of that. Okay. You know, if you come back tell me, oh, I have this part I do from the other course, that's not a strong and compelling reason. Let me be clear with you on that. Okay. Uh, now, for the project, of course, no late submission is allowed. Uh, and for the final exam, uh, the date actually is fixed already. I'll tell you the date. So it's on December, on Monday, December the 12th. Uh, <coughs> so that will be our final test. So uh, I do not accept. I do not accept uh, make up final exam because I have told you the date early than than you need to know. Uh, so you should fix this on your calendar. Okay, arrange your winter travel accordingly. That won't conflict with any other classes. I uh, yes for sure. So I I didn't pick up the date. The university uh, arranged the date. Okay. Actually. They, they use something called linear programming uh, to uh, to solve this, right? You put in all the constraints uh, because there's a constraint on the class. Uh, they put in all the constraint form a system. You run simplex algorithm. That's your output. Uh, so university fixed the date. I do not have. Any and the date is December uh, the twelfth, Monday, from ten thirty to twelve thirty. After the project, will there be several submissions or just one? There will be, of course, several submissions. You start from basic modules and move on to more sophisticated modules. Okay. And how will we be submitting them? Uh, that's a good question. So I'm still in the process of setting up the product framework, the lot of, as you can imagine, moving from minimalist to simple DB, a completely new system makes a lot of work for me. Uh, I'm still debating whether to use GitHub or just switch to the old fashioned model. I'm leaning towards using GitHub. So uh, each of you will, each team will get a GitHub account, follow the master branch which I'm attend, and you check out. And whenever I release a new assignment, you check on merge into your uh, assignment one branch, assignment two branch, and for submission, I have a script. You just run the script, it will generate a tarball, tag in GitHub, push, commit, send a notification to DS. If we can do that. I'm still, hope, I'm still hoping we can do that. Depending on how fast I can send this thing out. Anything else? Okay. So the only thing I want to go over before I jump to the first lecture is uh, this class homepage. In Canvas, I also set up a class homepage. For the most part, in lecture slides, homework assignments, homework solutions, product assignments will be uh, distributed out from this page, which is a public site. Everyone can see. Right? Uh, the homework, of course, will be protected by the uh, password. Now, the other things, the more sensitive things, Things like that, things of that nature will be distributed out using the canvas system where nobody can see your score, only yourself. And another nice feature I like about canvas, probably it's the only feature I like about canvas, is the discussion forum. Right? They have a discussion forum where you can post a question, then it, it generates a threat. Anyone, including the TAs, anyone in the class, can reply to the threat, uh, and you know that's that's been very useful in my opinion. Right? So so don't be shy. Ask questions. 
discussion forum on Canvas or ask questions during my lecture anytime. Right? Uh, just interrupt me when you feel you need to clarify certain things. Okay? Any questions? Now uh, let's move on to the lecture today. Taken my undergrad level class, uh, bear in mind that I have to do a few uh, lectures of review of basic stuff in order to understand what's, what is a data system. Pretty much like if you, if you tell someone you're going to build a car, you need to know what is a car. And you need to know how to drive a car before you actually build a car. Right? So that's essentially what we're going to do at the beginning part of this semester. We're going to spend two or three lectures to kind of do a warm up to get you started on what is a database system? What is it to build? And so we have to understand what is the thing first. So that will be the first few lectures. In particular, the first lecture will be on relational model. So our overview of is such a fundamental piece of software that you just cannot avoid using this. Right? Anywhere you go, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Vida, Goldman Sachs, uh, Stock Exchange Market, University Hospital, everywhere people are using some sort of database systems. Okay? So to, to name a few, this is <coughs> somewhat a current landscape <coughs> in the space of database systems. We have Hadoop, Spark, we have Hive, we have HBase, MongoDB, Redis, U4D, right? and, and, and many, many more. Right? So what this course is about is to teach you and to understand the principles behind the design and the implementation of all these systems, not just the relational database system. Right? But we will, of course, focus on relational database system. But the principle there uh, have been heavily leveraged when people design these other systems. For example, even when you design a graph database system like new 4 day they heavily use a lot of these principles. So here is the diagram, which I think clearly illustrates to you uh, the needs for a database system. So in the early 80s, right, when, we, when people did not have a database system at all, how people manage their data back then? Well, they use file system. Right? You all know what a file system is, right? So on the left is the approach people have taken uh, to manage their data when it is based off a file system. Okay? So you have to write some application program, and then this application program will with the interface of some high-level language. Java, C++, Python, whatever uh, you want to use. And then this high-level language, of course, you, you have a program running here using this high-level language. This program will be interacting with the operating system underneath. And then the operating system will be managing the file system uh, on your machine, which ultimately hold uh, your data. Right? So that's kind of like the workflow if you manage your data through operating <coughs> systems with a file system. On the right hand side is the system approach. The first two layers are the same. You have a user who have a you know inter uh, application program that the user will be interacting with. However that application program typically will be interacting with something called DBMS through a particular language called SQL, Structured Query Language. And what's so special about SQL compared to, on the left, this high-level language, Java, Python, and so on and so forth. But the major difference is SQL is not worry about how to, how to do it, how to compute the something you want. Okay? Keep this in mind, we will come back to this point later today. This SQL 
will be pushed to the DBMS, and the DBMS will translate SQL into something that the kernel understands, and SQL queries, and then interact with operating system on your behalf. So you don't have to interact with operating system directly through your program, rather DBMS interacts with the operating system. and get your data from the underlying cloud system. Okay? So that's kind of like the big picture. If we dive in a little bit, if I take out this module, the DBMS module, and zoom out this, zoom in a little bit. If we zoom into this module, what we have? We have this thing, right? This whole thing is DBMS. First of all, you need to have a SQL interpreter. SQL, a parser, right? To be able to pass and understand SQL. And then you have something called query evaluator. This module has three components. One is called plan generator. Plan optimizer will use the plan generator to generate different plans, different query plans, until the plan optimizer finds a so-called optimized plan. And that optimized plan is pushed to this plan executor, which will be responsible for executing your query according to that plan and get the results you want. And beneath the query evaluator module, the data access module. The data access module has these few components: buffer manager, security manager, file and index manager. Okay. And then another very important module is called transaction manager. This is really designed for supporting concurrent user access to the same database. Because in most cases, your database system does not have a single user. Oftentimes, it has multiple users. For example, Amazon.com, the database behind, <coughs> needs to support millions of users concurrent access to the database. Right? So that's taken care of by the transaction manager. And the transaction manager relies on two particular modules to make it work. One is called crash recovery, <coughs> the other is called concurrency, concurrency control. Crash recovery is for restoring the state of the database to a consistent state. If something goes bad, for example, system lose power, nose goes down, that's the job of crash recovery model. Concurs concurrency control model, on the other hand, is responsible for ensuring concurrent access to the database okay? in a valid and correct fashion. And then finally, at the bottom, your database, which is represented by your data files, your index files, and system meta metadata files. Okay? And this whole picture is we will be touching over all these modules, and you will be building uh, many of these modules in this picture over this over the course of this. Okay. All right. So why use a database management system? You know, well, you know. In other words, what's wrong with going with approach on the left hand side? Why we have to go approach like this on the right hand side in red color? Well, because it gives you all these nice features. It gives you concurrency control so that when you write your program, in other users who are concurrently accessing your data. Whereas if you do the left hand side approach, for, for example, you, you say, OK, I can do that using MPI. Yes, you can. But then, as programmer, you have to write that program carefully to coordinate concurrent access between different users, different threads, or different process. And that's very complicated, right? In a database management system approach, you don't have to worry about this. Crash recovery. You don't have to worry about some, if something goes bad, what happened to my job? The database management system magically will of your job. Whereas if you write your own program, <coughs> you do have to worry about that. What happened if system lose power in the middle of the execution of my program? In most cases, nothing happens, right? Meaning you lose all the jobs you have done so far. Unless you are an extremely talented and extremely careful programmer, and you take that into consideration while writing the program. But 
talk to yourself. Think about all the code you have written so far. Have you ever <coughs> taken this into consideration? Sorting execution. The naive answer, I, I know many of you will say simply, you know, I will rerun this. What's the big deal? Right? If you are sorting one million numbers, that's not a big deal. But if you're sorting 10 terabytes of data and you're halfway done and system lose power and you have to rerun this, if you if you do this once, that's okay. If it happens on a daily basis, uh, no, you cannot afford do, to do that, right? You lose valuable system resource and time uh, in this. And on the other hand, DBMS, the state of the database as close as it can be to the point <coughs> the system has crashed. So that it doesn't have to rerun anything from scratch. Okay? Just, just give you some flavor why we want to use the database system. Okay? There are some other important features, and I think you will become uh, appreciating them uh, while we move, on, move along this, uh, in this course. Okay? So the first thing we need to understand in your database system is what we call data models which is the abstract database system in the real world. You know, each one of you, for example, is a grad student. Each one of you is a grad student. But each one of you comes from diverse backgrounds, have many, many different features or properties. So a fundamental question a database system has to answer first is, if I want to model you as a grad student, what are the features? that should be kept in my abstraction. Does that make sense? And this process is what we call data modeling. And the most popular model by far people have used. So what is so why study relation model? Well, it is the most widely used model for structured data. You'll find this in uh, literally all database systems. And the principle behind relational model actually motivates the design of some other models, such as XML and JSON and so on and so forth. That's used for what we call structured slash semi-structured data. Keep in mind, relational model is use is useful for structured data. Structured data. So what is structured? Refer to those data sets where there's something called schema that describe the structure of the data. The specific values in your data set can vary from record to record, but the structure from record to record stay the same. When that's the case, we refer to such a data set for, uh, as structured data. Give you an example, when I say grad student, and when I abstract a grad student by a few attributes, such as, as student ID, first name, last name, and H. Let's say we only have this four. What you notice immediately is if you have a collection of grad students' records, the values on those attributes may differ from student to, to student, but the structure stays the same. Each one of them, each one of these records have four fields, exactly. Nothing less, nothing more. And when that happens, that's called structured data. In contrast, I'll give you an example where, uh, of unstructured data. Increasingly, right, I want to know more about things around me. In the past, maybe I only care about your first name, last name, and age, and student ID. I don't care much at all of the other. I want to do some deep analytics on our student population. For that purpose, I want to know their hobby, I want to know where they come from, what courses they are taking, what activities they typically go to, and things of that nature. And for the argument's sake, for different segments of students, I may care about different things. For example, for computer science students, I care about you know, what language they use for, the, for writing their code, what projects, what programming projects they have worked on in the past, and so on and so forth. But then obviously for a history of archaeology attributes or properties, you follow me? So it makes no sense in that situation to use the same structure to describe all my students, regardless of their backgrounds, right? So as extremely 
uh, naive approach in addressing that limitation is to uh, use a key value uh, uh, approach, key value pair approach, where every start comes with only two components, a key and a value. The key is your student ID, a unifier. Value is simply a collection of bytes. It can be anything. So this is an example of unstructured data. Right? You can put what you know programming assignments and programming language uh, or you know uh, internship uh, experience for a computer science student as the value part. Whereas for uh, archaeology student, I may put places he or she has visited, projects he or she has been working on, and so on and so forth, a different set of uh, uh, attributes as a value for an archaeology student. Where, you know, in this case, the statement I made going from record to record, not only the values are different, but the structure are different as well. Okay? So, we will start with structured data, and towards the end of the semester, we'll, I will talk about unstructured data as well, uh, when we have a full understanding of structure and some structured data. Okay. Now, the relation model is very easy to, uh, to it comes with a set of relations, that's why it's called the relational model. A relation has two parts. One is what we call an instance, uh, which is number of rows is what we call the cardinality of the table. And then it has a schema, which specifies the name of the relation plus name and type for each attribute in that relation. Now you can think of relation as a set of rows, or what, what we call them as tuples. And one thing to note is all rows are distant. Here is an example. Okay? The first row here is what we call the schema of, the, of this relation. The schema of this relation. Okay? The schema of the relation contains a set of columns, the name for each column, and the type for each column. What's being omitting from this slide is the type of each column. But you can easily you know, imagine the type for each, uh, for each attribute. For example, the first one, SID, could be an integer, could be a string. Okay? Name, obviously, is a string. Login, the string. H is an integer. JP is a float. So the type of a particular attribute is actually fairly important because it specifies the possible value you may take. So for example, when I say h is an integer, that actually tells you you cannot put a value such as 18.5 as a value for any h attribute. Does that make sense? So type of an attribute actually specifies the possible values uh, that column may take. So that's the first row basically tells you the schema of your relation. The schema of your relation essentially gives you the structure of your relation. Without looking at the instance below, if you just tell me the schema of the relation, I can already tell you what goes into that table. Does that make sense? What goes into that table. Okay. Now, one thing to note is in, a, in the relational model, all tuples or all records must be distinct. In other words, you cannot find two rows that are identical to each other. When I say two rows are identical, they have to be identical on all. They have to be on. They have to be identical on all fields. For example, I may have two students, like the last two records, who share the same name but they are not considered as two identical rows as long as you have at least one field they have different values on okay, in this case obviously we know SID must be distinct they may have the same name they may have same age, same JP, but they cannot have same SID value and there is another must be distinct, right? you cannot have two students who have the same login value Next, we're going to briefly talk about SQL. So once 
once you have this relational model, you have to have a query language to manipulate and interact with data stored in this model. And that language is called SQL, Structured Query Language. And SQL comes with two parts. One is what we call DDL, the other is what we call DNL. DDL is what we call Data Definition Language, and it's used to create, modify, and delete relations. And DNL is uh, used to retrieve data from the underlying relational data. And here is just a quick overview of SQL. We will have a detailed study of SQL uh, on Thursday. Today, I just want to give you a quick overview of this. So for example, you can create table, you can insert into table, you can delete from table, you can update and select. Okay. And specifically, these two examples shows you how to create a table called student, how to create a table called involved. As you can tell, this essentially specifies the schema for these two tables, for the student and because you have the name of each column and you specify the type for each column as well. That's essentially give you the schema of the, of the table. So in other words, create table does nothing else but specifying the schema of your table. Now, if you want to, but having schema alone is not enough, right? Schema only tells you the structure of underlying data. You want to have specific values as records for the underlying data, right? The way you do that is by inserting or delete, insert into student with that set of values, or I can delete from student where a certain condition is met. A certain condition is met. Okay? Note that in the second example here, one or more records may be affected, depending on how many students have the name attributes equal to Smith, the values of their name attribute equal to Smith. Could be one student, could be multiple students, or could be zero students, right? So how many records are affected by this is unknown. But we know exactly there will be one new record being inserted into the database. Okay. Now, next we want to introduce something called the concept of keys. This is a very important concept. You, you, you all must understand this particular concept. So keys are a way to associate tuples in different relations. Uh, keys are one form of what we call integrity constraint, which we will be discussing this in uh, further detail in some later slides. So to give you a, a flavor of what are the keys, consider these two examples. I have a student and a records. This has four records, right? So how do I associate records from the two ends? Example, how do I know the name of the student who has taken topology 12 and topology 12 and got an A in that class? That information is not available in the enroll table. On the other hand, it is actually available in the student table. The way you can associate records between and across tables is by using something called key. And the key in this case for the student table is SID. Okay? Why don't we simply put all this data into a single table? Why do we have to break them into two or more tables. Well, this is something called normalization of your database. Normalization of your database. The fundamental way that people do normalization, which is the process, the process of breaking up table into smaller tables, is to get rid of redundancy. Is to get rid of redundancy. Imagine if you were to put all of this into a single table. What happens? What happens? Uh, rows, like for uh, first two, it's the same student, but it, yeah, that student's taking two courses, so we'll be duplicating the name, login, age, and gpu. Yeah, very good. What's your name? Nitu. Say again? Nitu. Nitu. Nitu said, if we were to put that into a single table, then we have to face this problem of duplication. Right? In particular, looking at this particular record, this student has taken three classes, okay? If we were to use a single table to represent this piece of information, the name of that student will be duplicated at least three times, or as many times as he or she are taking classes for. You may argue, you know, fine, points taken, but disks are super cheap nowadays. I can buy a one terabyte disk using $100. You know, if I'm Google, why I care? 
I can afford to buy terabytes or petabytes of, uh, of, of disk. Duplication is not a problem. I don't care. Well, if you think about duplication, internal storage is just a minor issue, actually. If you were to do that, think about what happened if you try to update. For example, I've tried to update the GP value of this student from 3.4 to 3.6. Now, instead of updating in a single place, now you have to update, I don't know how many times. In this case, only three times, right, if you were to put that together. But if you're Google, right, you have a user who has sent, you know, a corporation user who has sent millions of queries over time, and you maintain some statistics, corporate, corporate account. Instead of updating in a single place once, you have to update millions of times. And even worse, it's not just a matter of efficiency. In the process of updating that millions of copies, something can go wrong easily. And then you have an even worse scenario where you are left with <coughs> inconsistent values for the same object. That makes sense? In other words, in this universe, this is called Apple. In another universe, this is called Orange. And they don't want to when in reality, they actually refer to the exact same object. Does that make sense? And these kind of issues uh, is the reason why we need to do normalization in data. And, and furthermore, there's one more point I try to bring up, which is storage might not be a big concern, but efficiency is, right? If you were to duplicate this three times or millions of times, that actually will increase your query cost as well because you're reading more data. Uh, uh, you know, well, using this quote unquote duplicate values multiple times. So there is actually a deep theory and uh, uh, discussion involved in normalization, which I will not cover in this class. If you're interested in that, you can look up my uh, slides and material for the undergrad data class where we have a, a dedicated session for that. Okay? So, keys are useful once you have normalization because you need to have keys to link them back. If you don't have keys, how do you know they actually refer to the same object, right? So, to properly define the concept of key, here comes a set of concepts. A set of fields is a super key. If no two distinct tuple can have same values in all key fields, that's the definition of a super key. So if you look at this definition, pretty much, right, pretty much a schema will have many, many super keys. In the very least, in the very least, a schema has one super key which is simply everything, all, all attributes. Why? Because no, we just said in the relational model. No two records can be identical to each other. And all attributes, that by the definition will give you a super key. Because the definition says no two distinct tuples can have same values in all key fields. So when you have all attributes from a schema, that means no two records can have same values on all those attributes at the same time. That gives you a super key by definition. What are some other super keys? If I come back here, if we consider students as an example, the another super key. Why? Why this is another super key? Because no two records can have same values on all key fields. You may have two student records who share the same name value, but they can never share the same SID value. They have two FeiFei in the same class in the same university, but they must have different assets. So by definition, this is a super key. Okay? It's that you know SID combined with anything else give you a super key. Combined with age, combined with GPA, or uh, all of these are super keys. So you may have many, many super keys. Okay. Now, what's the what's the concept of key? So key is recursively defined 
uh, a key has to be a super key. So it has to be a super key. By the way, this is not, obviously this is not a super key. Huh? Is this a super key? No, right? Because yeah. I can easily find two records who share the same name and same GPA. That happens all the time. Okay? So a key must be a super key to begin with. And second, that's why I call it a key is recursively defined. No proper subset of the fields is a super key. No proper subset of the fields is a super key. So some of you might be puzzled by that definition. But mathematically speaking, this is a very precise definition. There are no ambiguity involved. Right? So let's look at one particular example. Let's look at SID and name. It is satisfied the first constraint because it is a super constraint. Right? So it does satisfy our first requirement. The second requirement says no proper subset can be a super key. What are the proper subset of this of this super key? It has two attributes. Three, right? If you count the empty set. So you have empty set. Note that it must be proper subset, meaning it, the set itself is not considered as a subset. It is considered as a subset, but not a proper subset. Uh, so the only proper subset of trail this. Okay? And the requirement says none of them can be a super key. Empty set cannot be a super key, right? Because what do you mean by no two records can have same values with respect to an empty set of attributes? It doesn't even make any sense. So that's okay. So it cannot be a super key. What about name? Well, it is not a super key. So this is not a super key. This is not a super key. Why? Name obviously is not a super key. Because I can easily find two students with the same name value, right? But what about SID? Uh, SID is a super key because you cannot find two records have the same value. Now, by our definition, this is not a key. Right? Because but you have at least one proper subset who is a super key. By definition, this is not a key. <coughs> So what is the key? Well, if you look at SID, it is a key. Uh, in this case, the answer is yes, right? It is a super key. And no proper subset is a super key. Because the only proper subset for SID is empty set, which is not a super key. So it is a key. So this key, as you can see from these examples, has this property of linearity, meaning that Attribute that is smallest in size when it comes in determining or distinguishing different records. Smallest in size. In, in other words, you cannot remove any one attribute from a key and still make another key out of it. Okay? You may have more than one key for a relation, by the way. For example, in this case, in the student case, we have two keys. One is SID, what's the other key? You may have even more than just this two. What you the specification you got. For example, I may tell you in my university, in my university, okay, well, let me see what, what I have. Okay, students with the same name must be given different JPA values. It's a very bizarre rule. Let me just I just make up this rule. But let's say I have this university where it says student with same names cannot have same JPA values. What do they tell you? What I tell you is some name is become has become a super key. Not only is a super key but it become a key. Because if you look at the subset of it, GPA itself is not unique. Name itself is not unique. But the combination of them is that gives you a key. So this brings up another important point, which is when I say a key is minimal in size, this is with respect to the key itself. 
you don't compare two keys for the same schema and argue, oh, this has more than the other, hence the second is not a key. For example, in this, in, in this particular example, you will have three keys. Each key is minimal in size with respect to itself. You do not compare the size of the keys from one against another. Okay. So when you have more than one key, what happens? Well, you choose one of the keys as your primary key, and the rest of the keys must be keys, not super keys. So here is an example of how you express that in SQL. Use the keyword primary key and unique to specify primary key and candidate keys. Does that make sense? So, in this example, if I tell you for a given student and course there is a single grade, what that means? That means the combination of student ID and ID is the key for the schema. In other words, this is a really tough university. You cannot afford to fail. Why? Because you're given only a single grade. One time deal. If you fail, sorry, you cannot retake it. You cannot get another grade for the same course. That makes sense? So the combination of it is key. But the specification says nothing about whether the student can take multiple courses or a course can have multiple students enrolling it. So student ID by itself or course ID by itself cannot be key. Versus the latter, if I tell you, in addition to that, I also tell the student can take only one course and receive a single grade for that course. Furthermore, no two students in a course receive the same grade. Let's say in my daily class, I want to have a strict ranking of all of you at the end of the semester. Right? I want to do that. Strict ranking. Like Olympic Games. <laughs> Usually, in Olympic Games, right? In Olympic games, sometimes they actually have ties, but more than often I don't see ties. Actually, they go several digits beyond uh, if it's time time uh, competing uh, events, right? Kind of who has shortest? We we'll look at further digits in uh, after decimal uh, to break out ties. Right? To break out. In fact, uh, this is a really good example. Either the U.S. Uh, women relating, right? Uh, is warranted to rerun the match. Right? I don't know whether, whether they watch the news or not. And what's interesting, that itself is interesting already, right? But what's even more interesting is uh, U.S. team was disqualified, right? Uh, because they were uh, affected by the Brazil, uh, the, the Brazil team. So they were given another chance to rerun the match. But, but the contour thing in that case, is there were eight teams uh, qualified. But we don't have the seventh and eighth team, but rather we have two teams ranked as sevens. They, they are tied. The Canadian team and the Chinese team. <laughs> okay? They're tied. So but when US is was given another chance to rerun, somebody needs to be locked out because only eight teams can go to the final. So what do you do in that case? What do you do in that case? So street ranking. You have to come up with some sort of street ranking, right? So in, in the end of the day they figure out a way to to rank them and the Chinese team was <laughs> to so the case. So let me say, uh, let me, let's say we give, we are given this constraint. Then in, in addition to this particular primary key, we have another primary key, which is a combination of course ID and grade. Does that make sense? Why? Because the combination of them must be unique, given this particular constraint. No two students can have the same grade on the same course. So once the course ID the same grade must be unique. But without this constraint, this is not a key. It's perfectly okay for still having the same grade, the same course. This actually tells you as a programmer, you don't make up keys for the schema. So where are keys, where 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 does all the keys come from? Well, they come from user specification. From whoever asks you to build database, they will give you constraints and specifications, and your keys come from those constraints and specifications. Now, with all those understood, let's introduce the next concept, which is called foreign key. The foreign key is the field the value of keys in another relation, kind of like pointers. So, for example, 
uh, as ID is a foreign key in this the student table where as ID is a key. So that's the concept of foreign key, and it's fairly easy to specify uh, foreign key in uh, SQL. You simply use the keyword foreign key with, a, uh, with another keyword called references to indicate where this foreign key comes from, which table this foreign key is a key uh, for that table. That's all you need to do. And this brings up this concept called integrity constraints, which in addition that must be true for any instance of the database. For example, domain constraint is one type of Right? If you specify h is an integer, you cannot have a valid instance of your database where some record has 18.5 and h when the type of h is integer. So domain uh, type is a form of integrated constraint. A foreign key is another form of integrated constraint. Right? An instance that satisfies all Integrity constraint is what we call a legal instance. An instance that satisfies all your constraints is what we call a legal instance. And the database system should only allow legal instance and should reject illegal instance. Okay. So I talked about this already, so I will skip this slide. Where do ICs come from? Programmers, you do not specify ICs. It comes from user specification, just as in the case of key constraints. Now, enforcing uh, referential integrity constraint. In particular, foreign key constraint is what we call a referential integrity constraint. Referential integrity constraint. In particular, think about what happens if a is a non-existent student ID is inserted. For example, somebody is trying to register my daily class, but when he or she hasn't got a UID yet, what happens? Right? That's a scenario that applies to this example. Well, you should reject it. If you have this foreign key constraint in place, you should reject it. Students should not be able to register classes until they are formally a student of the university. Very natural, very natural, natural and intuitive. But what happens if a student tuple is deleted? Well, one option is automatically, meaning the programmers or the users of the database system doesn't have to, don't really have to worry about it. When he or she has deleted a student record, the system, and the underlying system will automatically delete all the enrolled records referring to that student record. Why we need to do this? Well, this is done in the same motivation as something called So you allocate some object instance and you have some pointers pointing to those object instance. Some point later in later in later part in your code, you are done with the object instance, you deallocate that object instance, you delete. Does that make sense? So for example, this piece of code.
sounds easy, right? But in reality, uh, this is actually extremely hard to do this in complex systems. Now, that's the reason why when you delete the student record, it's better to delete all the enrolled records before you because it's dumping point reach, right? dumping references. However, database system is a little bit more complex than you uh, programming language example, than programming language. It could be that somebody was making uh, a mistake. You should only delete a student record when you are sure all references to uh, the student object has been deleted. So if you take that rationale, what you should do is you should reject the deletion of the student record. Does that make sense? And this actually is the point utilized by this garbage collection mechanism in Java. Right? The only time it's safe for you to deallocate an object by GVM is when there are no more references to this object. When you are sure there are no more references to this object. Right? So this is essentially similar to that. The, the last option, of course, is to allow the deletion of the student record, but I want to keep you may wonder, isn't this exactly against the principle you just mentioned about dumping pointer? Well, keep in mind we are in a database system. The point of database system is to keep data around so that people can do analysis over this data. I'll give you a simple scenario. A student might be graduating from the university. University no longer care about the specific record concerning the student, but for analytical purposes, I want to keep academic records for all students. To, to be able to do uh, analysis such as the average grade over the years students have got for a particular this statistical analysis or aggregation type of analysis, right? Does it make sense? I no longer care who actually got this grade, but I do care what's the average, what's the mean, what's the quantile, so on and so forth. So in order to support all those applications, I do need to keep those records uh, 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 around for a little while. Does that make sense? So I, I need to enable the deletion of student record while keeping all the enrolled record referring to referring back to that student record. In that case what happens is you can set the student ID by for uh, student ID value. Uh, sometimes you can use now or some other default value uh, so that uh, this allows you to delete the student record without deleting all the enrolled records. Okay? <coughs> now let's look at I, give you a, I, give, I will give you a brief, view, a brief overview of relational query languages. I mentioned SQL for a number of times. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Okay? In particular, here you have SQL. The top query over there gives you all students who, and the example below gives you the name and the login of those students in HID. Okay? It has a where clause, specify the condition, and specify uh, the base table where data come from, and this gives you uh, the final output. <coughs> and this is an example for a single table. Here is an example of uh, putting over multiple tables. So I have student and enrolled. I want to find student who got A in any class. When that happens, I want to print out <coughs> the name of the student and the course ID. So any student who has ever got uh, uh, A in any class, when that, whenever that happens, I want to find that course. So given these two instances, uh, this is, will be my output. This will be my output. And the way you write that query is what's shown on top, but more importantly, you need to understand how that's actually executed, right? The conceptual way to understand queries over multiple tables is as follows. From the front class, we what we call the cross product. Then in the cross product, you check the where clause. You eliminate records in the cross product who do not satisfy the where clause. At the end of the day, you delete unwanted field. These two input instances. Okay? How do I evaluate the query on top? Well, the naive solution is to use exactly what I have just said. The first step is you do the cross product. Right? What happens in the cross product? When you have three records here and four records over there, you have 12 records in total. Every student record is paired with every enrolled record. And you do this for every single student record. So that gives you 
these 12 records in total, that's your cross product. And in your cross product, you eliminate all those records who do not satisfy the word class, and in particular, only this one satisfies your word class, where S and E are the same, and the grid is A. That's the only record in this cross product that satisfies the word class. And once you find those records, what do you do? You eliminate unwanted fields. What are the wanted fields? In this case, name and CID, right? So for this record, you put out the name and perfect. That will be we'll conclude today's lecture by saying, keep in mind, this is the conceptual evaluation of SQL query. And that's exactly the point of having this class, because we are not going to do this. Because what's the cost of this approach? We have two tables. Each table has roughly n records. What's the cost of this approach? n squared. We have three tables, this becomes a cube. We have m tables, this becomes n to the power of m. No system can afford to do this. No system can afford to do this. So how exactly we're going to do this much more efficiently? Well, we will we'll continue on